Good evening. I'm Tom Carlo, KPBS General Manager, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 14th annual One Book, One San Diego launch event. Please join me in giving a virtual warm round of applause to Genbu Taiko. Thank you for a wonderful performance and thank you to the Japanese Friendship Garden Society of San Diego. This was such a great way to kick off the 14th one book, one San Diego season. Now I've been with KPBS for 47 years, so that means I've seen all 14 one book seasons, but tonight is a bit different. Instead of being in a large theater, we're looking at a screen. Instead of sharing 
uh, an in-person moment with other avid readers, we are apart. But as our guest of honor this evening has expressed, quote, these are historic times. The pandemic has changed all of our lives. We are making choices to get through this time with hope, love, and compassion. And it's an honor to host George Takei this evening to talk about his moving graphic memoir, They Call This Enemy. So George, thank you very much for being with us tonight. One Book, One San Diego is one of my favorite community outreach programs. A big part of this is because it is truly a community initiative. One Book is presented in partnership between KPBS and over 80 public libraries, service organizations, and educational institutions. And since its inception, every One Book event has been free and open to the public. And we can only do this because of our generous One Book sponsors. And we wanna say thanks to our sponsors. And they are the Lyndon Root Dickinson Foundation, Lloyd Pest Control, the Dr. Seuss Fund at the San Diego Foundation, Kaiser Permanente, San Diego Commission for Arts and Culture, the Payne Family Foundation, and the Seth Sprague Educational Charitable Foundation. So thank you to all of our great sponsors. I'd also like to thank our One Book, One San Diego Advisory Committee. The group is made up of library professionals and educators who select the books each year. This is not an easy task. Thank you everyone on the committee for choosing such a moving book for our community to read. And I have one housekeeping item. item. If you have a question you would like to ask George, please type it in the comment section. There will be time later in the program for Q&A. And now I'd like to introduce Professor Susan Hasekawa of San Diego City College to talk about Japanese Americans in San Diego during World War II. Hello, my name is Susan Hasegawa and I'm a professor of history at San Diego City College. And right now we are here in the Japanese American Historical Society of San Diego's gallery at the San Diego History Center in Balboa Park. Welcome. In 2008, I published Japanese Americans in San Diego, which was a pictorial history book covering then the experience of Japanese Americans from the 1880s to the 1980s in San Diego. And that book then covered the first Japanese immigrants, or Issei, who settled in the 1880s, talked about getting into farming, fishing, businesses in downtown San Diego, and then starting families and planting roots here in San Diego. Now, in 1940, according to the census, there were something like 2,000 persons of Japanese ancestry in San Diego County, down to the border, all the way up to Oceanside. By 1942, there were zero people of Japanese American, Japanese immigrant persons in San Diego County. Why? After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, there was a lot of suspicion, anxiety about the immigrant Japanese population and their children, or the Nisei generation. Nisei means second generation, American-born persons of Japanese ancestry. And so with the attack on Pearl Harbor, there was suspicion, there were all these rumors, and people started talking about Japanese are not loyal or patriotic to the United States. And then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 on February 19th, 1942. That enabled the military to make decisions to clear out, evacuate forcibly, and incarcerate all persons of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. Starting in April 1st, signs went up around San Diego at post offices in on utility poles that persons of Japanese ancestry had one week to settle their belongings, pack up, and report to Santa Fe Depot. So 
on April 8th. That's what Issei, their families, their Nisei children, who were, they were American citizens, then went down to Santa Fe Depot and the next evening, a train departed from San Diego to Santa Anita Racetrack. And that was home. Horse stables and, you know, hurriedly put up barracks, but mainly horse stables for then the San Diego population. From Santa Anita Racetrack after several months, another train ride. Then San Diego County's Japanese Americans ended up in Poston, Arizona. You've never heard of Poston, Arizona, have you? Well, it is out in the middle of the desert, north of I-10, if you drive right across the, the Colorado River, okay, in the middle of a Native American Indian Reservation. And that was the home for many of San Diego County's Japanese American population for the duration of the war. Starting December 1st, 1945, people, Japanese Americans, could return to the West Coast. Would San Diego be a welcoming place? And in fact, many people in San Diego were not. The city council, the San Diego City Council passed a resolution saying we don't want Japanese Americans to come back to San Diego. And so there were still a lot of questions, but the government had decided. There were San Diegans that came back right after in January. In fact, there was a, a young man who wanted to graduate with his class up in North County. So he came back very quickly. Um, starting in 1945, then train loads coming in. And in the middle of a, you know, boom in the population, defense industries, conveyor starting up. And so you have then just, just this, what's called the blitz boom, as one scholar point, put it, and this is then the, the, what San Diegans had to come back to. They had to then scramble for housing. Many of them were doubling up and, you know, families that owned homes that could secure their homes then helped other families come back. People had to find jobs. Sometimes they took jobs as, you know, live-in help for other people. And children. Children returned back and some of them had very happy reunions with their classmates that they hadn't seen in several years. Others had a really tough time, were bullied, and took a while. Um, it took just for the San Diego population another 10 years until 1950 to then come up to that 2000 again. You had an influx of the Nisei professionals. These are college educated engineers, um, accountants um, who went to college and then are finding jobs in the growing um, suburban population in San Diego, along with then all the defense industries. And so little by little, the Japanese American population put their lives back together. And I know that George Takei in his book talks about the difficulty his parents had in returning to the Los Angeles area. And what I really like about the book is it shows all the different viewpoints from his mother to his father to George Takei as a young child and what that transition was like. And so when you take a look at that, really think about the family dynamics and how, and how the trauma of incarceration and then coming back really impacted individuals and families. Thank you, Professor Asakawa. Now it's my privilege to introduce author, actor, and activist George Takei. His graphic memoir, They Call This Enemy, is this year's One Book, One San Diego selection for adult, teen, and Spanish language readers. Yes, George's book was selected for all three categories, a triple crown for one book, one San Diego. The story recounts George's haunting childhood in American concentration camps as one of 120,000 Japanese Americans 
Yes, Japanese American uh, citizens imprisoned by the United States government during World War II. George will be interviewed tonight by KPBS arts reporter, Beth Accomando. Beth covers arts and culture from Comic-Con to opera, from pop entertainment to fine art, from zombies to Trekkies to Ch Shakespeare. Beth is known for going behind the scenes to explore the creative process to see how pop culture reflects social issues and to provide a context for art and entertainment. So Beth, it's all yours. Welcome to One Book, One San Diego. Hello. Welcome, George. And uh, it's a great honor and privilege to be talking to you again. I spoke to you when you were here in San Diego for Allegiance, which was a fabulous show. So first of all, I just want to know what prompted you to write the book at this time? Why didn't you tackle it earlier or wait longer? What was it that made you want to do it at this particular moment? Well, thank you, One Book, One San Diego, San Diego for inviting me as well as uh, certainly to select my book for this special honor. And uh, I am so happy to be back in San Diego because uh, you saw Allegiance here. Allegiance, uh, uh, San Diego welcomed Allegiance with open arms at the uh, Old Globe Theater. And for this program to begin with the uh, Taiko concert right there in, in the Japanese garden down from the uh, Prado restaurant, it's familiar grounds to me because the Old Globe Theater is right stone sto throw from there. So it, it it is wonderful to be back in San Diego and to be chatting with you again, Beth. Uh, about uh, another project of mine. Uh, what prompted me to write this um, uh, graphic memoir? Well, actually, it's been my life mission to raise the awareness of uh, this sad and dark chapter of American history where innocent people, Japanese Americans, were rounded up and imprisoned with no basis in fact. There were no charges, no trial no due process, and imprisoned. And so from the time I was in my uh, late 20s, I've been speaking uh, at gatherings and, and schools on the internment of Japanese Americans to get Americans to know more about our own American history, uh, this chapter, because there are so many important lessons. And uh, one of the uh, efforts was an effort to, uh, I wrote my autobiography, which was published in 1994. And the first third was on the internment of uh, our family. And so when this, but, but after the publication and a, even after Allegiance, which uh, we did Allegiance because we wanted to humanize that story. And we did move people we heard a lot of sobs coming from the audience at the Old Globe. And, and yet, when I travel throughout the country, there are people that I consider well-informed, educated people. When I share my childhood imprisonment with them, they're shocked that something like that happened. There are so many Americans that don't know our own American history. And so my effort has always been to 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 uh, erase the awareness of this uh, fact. And so I wrote my uh, autobiography uh, wh where in the first third is about my childhood incarceration and our return back to Los Angeles and the struggle there. But uh, the, uh, that still really didn't... Uh, get that many people, particularly in the Midwest and the uh, East Coast. And <clears throat> I thought, we really need to get young people to know this history so that they grow up. You know, when you're young and uh, uh, you're absorbing in information through your pores, it becomes a part of you growing up. And so... That's how we came uh, up with the idea of doing a graphic memoir. Because when I was a young teenager, I loved comic books. And this was a way to get 
to the young readership, uh, the teen and also the young adults. And so that's how uh, a graphic memoir based on fact uh, was uh, the next form of uh, telling the story of American history. And how did you think a graphic novel could be more effective than just uh Well, it looks like we popped on and off for a yes. there. <laughs> I got Inside. half your question. <laughs> so how um how do you think a graphic novel can be more effective in telling this story? What did you think would uh, would make that to appeal to a broader audience? Well, you know, there are positives in both graphic as well as uh, uh, non-graphic, just uh, uh, words. Words paint a picture, or the um, mind, the mind's eye sees uh, the, uh, the uh, situation uh, through words. And some people have vivid, rich imaginations. And so uh, I'm not all, you know, uh, comparing and favoring one over the other. But graphic novels uh, are a, a way to get to young people, as I was attracted to it. And uh, it's a um, way of uh, helping young people who uh, need that boost of, of having the visualization already done for you. And and uh, I must say, the artist that we found, Harmony Becker, is enormously talented. She's able to capture emotions with just a dot and a squiggle and also to, to uh, recreate uh, in a, a comic strip form uh, the, the uh, physical uh, appearance of people that, well, my parents. She, she's captured both my father and my mother so what, accurately and, and captured their personalities as well. And also the subtle things that she did uh, when we went on that unforgettable uh, uh, Jeep joyride out of the camp, uh, there's uh, our a scene of our returning back to camp and um, we're all getting sleepy. My brother went to sleep right beside me in, in the back seat and my baby sister who was on my mother's lap had gone to sleep. And, uh, and the way she pictured that scene, she had my mother holding hands with my father who was driving. Those little touches that literally brought tears, the, the relationship uh, of my uh, parents, uh, under those stressful, uh, horrible circumstances. Uh, she, she's a wonderful artist, and uh, I, I now really believe in uh, graphic memoir as a storytelling uh, device for young people. And how did you work with her? Did you discuss specific details, or did she go off kind of on her own and create things, and then you gave her feedback? What was that process like? Well, I told her first to read to the stars, um, where I, in, in words, I tell that same very same story. In fact, we use a lot of the words from to the stars uh, verbatim in in the book. Uh, so if you want to check out that book uh, and add that to another uh, book uh, <laughs> with one book, San Diego. Uh, but that's an, another way of uh, getting a bit more uh, uh, fine grained details of that story uh, and the com coming back. Uh, and so she read that. And then I showed her a lot of photos uh, from our family album of, uh, we had only one picture taken of us uh, within uh, the camp itself, but uh, she got an idea of what my father looked like before camp and uh, how, how, how my mother dressed before camp and then after camp and she, uh, recreated uh, my parents wonderfully and added those little touches that we hadn't discussed until I saw what she did. And I was so touched by that. She, she has, a, has her own imagination and she added her creative touch that uh, warmed my heart so much. 
Well, I noticed in some of the panels, it looked like there was the like Japanese origami paper kind of design and texture to some of the backgrounds. What scenes are you talking about? Because I, I don't think there was anything like that. Oh, it just looked like in some of the texture to the background, like the designs and stuff. I can't remember a specific panel, but it just looked like she had added some really nice, subtle, very subtle detail, but it kind of gave it this, this feel of like Japanese, well, I can think of as Japanese origami paper. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really didn't see, and I didn't want it to be too uh, uh, artfully Mm -hmm. uh, Japanese because like internment experience was not a beautiful experience uh, and she did capture the uh, coarse rough uh, mm -hmm. edges of that experience I don't know I I, I can't imagine any scene that uh, had origami or you know Japanese watercolors is kind of evanescent you know uh, mm -hmm. very very uh, poetic and calming and Although my memories of uh, the Arkansas camp, which was in the swamp, and it, that was an adventure for me, for this Southern Californian kid, you know, uh, coming to uh, the swamps of Arkansas with the humidity and the lushness and uh, and all the magical creatures there and the sounds that came from the bayou, uh, which um, I, I, one of the scenes I still... Uh, uh, savor and I do, uh, uh, and th this is from the uh, uh, original autobiography uh, uh, to the stars. Uh, when we first arrived, uh, we were uh, picked up uh, from the train uh, uh, in a truck with our luggage, and uh, the uh, people that belonged in our block uh, were all loaded on to that and driven to our block and we were all dumped there with our luggage and my father left us waiting on the luggage while he um, scouted out where our uh, assigned barrack was and so while we were waiting we were and we were right near the uh, barbed wire fence sounds from the swamp could be heard screeching sounds cowing sounds <coughs> you know exotic sounds and there were two big big boys they, they must have been uh nine or ten said uh do, do i know what those uh sounds are and i said no what are they they said it's it's dinosaur sounds and i said dino what and he said don't you know what dinosaurs are dummy and i said uh i said no i don't tell me and he said they, they were great big huge monsters that lived millions and millions of years ago and then they died. And I said, they died? How come we can hear them out there beyond the barbed wire fence? And uh, he got a little fumbly fidgety, but he came up with the, he said, they died everywhere but in Arkansas. And that's why they built these barbed wire fence to keep them caged in. So I, uh, I, I love that scene because it's, uh, looking at the barbed wire fence from a total, totally different perspective. It's to keep the dinosaurs out for our protection rather than keeping us confined. Well, you bring up something that I think was done really well in the book, which is this contrast between what a child perceives of the world and what is really going on and what the adults know. And how did you, how did you work on getting that to be in a good balance for the graphic memoir? Well, uh, again, I go back to, you know, this is all from uh, To the Stars. And I really uh, spent a lot of time trying to dredge up my memories from uh, camp and then uh, se selectively using those memories for its um, uh, multiple uh, nuances, like the dinosaur being... Uh, caged uh we also um, played games in, in camp you know and out, out, out of camp uh, we might have played cowboys and indians but there's a war going on and we know about war and we played war games and somebody had to be the japanese and somebody had to be the, the americans innocent children playing games but you know we're killing each other 
And so I thought that would be, so uh, yes, I did select uh, events uh, with the idea of uh, the uh, multiple uh, nuances in those events. And the book also contains some actual historical references too. And did you feel that was important to kind of add this very kind of um, objective historical facts into your personal story? Well, the real story of the internment was experienced by my parents. I had that innocent child's experience. And uh, for me, Arkansas was uh, a real adventure catching pollywogs uh, and watching them turn in turn ma magic happens in arkansas these little wiggly black fish suddenly start growing a bump on on their side and the next morning the bumps are larger and then the next morning they look like legs and then the next morning they've lost their tail and they escape from my jar and the, uh, so you know i wanted to capture that magical uh, uh feeling of uh, uh, Arkansas. I must say the second camp that we were in, uh, imprisoned in was far from uh, a fun. That was a harrowing experience. Even as a, uh, by that time I was uh, seven and eight. And I have uh, a little bit uh, of um, uh, un unhappy memories associated with Tule Lake. But the real story is uh, uh, the experience of my parents. And I wanted to uh, merge that with my child's discovery. And so in the Arkansas camp, uh, well, we, we have to go back in his, uh, history a little bit. Uh, immediately after Pearl Harbor's bombing, young Japanese Americans, like young, all young Americans, rushed to their recruitment centers to volunteer to serve in the US military. This act of patriotism was answered with a slap on the face. They were denied military service and categorized as enemy aliens, which was the most irrational thing. I mean, we were all, all Japanese uh, Americans in the United States, whether you were on the East Coast or on the West Coast, were uh, categorized as Japanese or uh, enemy aliens. I wasn't an enemy. I was a five-year-old kid and I wasn't an alien. I was born in Los Angeles, California. My mother was born in Sacramento, California. My father was not born here. He was born in Japan, but brought to San Francisco as a, a young boy. Uh, I think he was uh, 11 or 12. And he, he was raised in San Francisco, educated in San Francisco, went to college in San Francisco. We were Americans, and yet we were categorized by the government with no basis in fact. It was totally irrational as enemy aliens. And then with no charges, with no trial, with no due process, with no factual evidence, the soldiers were sent to uh, imprison us. And I, I one morning that's uh, uh, embedded, burnt into my memory, is the day that the soldiers came to uh, order us out. So I wanted to include the larger real story uh, of my parents' experience. And so I brought in those uh, uh, factual events, historic events as experienced by my parents. And so, uh, and this is uh, uh, true. For some odd reason, I woke up uh, in the middle of the night uh, while we were in Arkansas, uh, and my parents were hovering, hovering over a, um, a kerosene lamp and whispering. And my mother seemed to be sniffling. And so, you know, for a child to wake up and, uh, and see and hear his mother uh, uh, crying uh, was kind of alarming. I said, Mama, don't cry. And my parents came over and said, no, no, we're talking about adult things. Go back to bed. And I suspect that that was when they were talking about the loyalty questionnaire. Now talk about irrationality. We were imprisoned and categorized as enemy aliens, which was completely irrational, no basis in fact. And, but after a year of imprisonment, the government realized 
that they ha had a wartime manpower shortage. And here were these young people that they could have had, but how do you draft people out of a prison camp once you've ca categorized them as enemy alien? It was a real dilemma, but they solved that by coming down with a loyalty questionnaire. Can you imagine the outrageous thing? They take everything from you, they impoverish you, and they imprison you for a year, and now they want you for military service. And so they come down, develop a, a, a demanding a loyalty question, answer we, that we asked her a loyalty questionnaire. Anyone over the age of 17 had to respond to it. And that loyalty questionnaire turned all 10 camps into turmoil because there were two questions that they had to answer with the yeses. One question, uh, question 27, asked, will you bear arms to uh, defend the United States of America? This being asked by parents. Essentially, the question was saying, will you abandon your children and bear arms to defend the country that's imprisoning your children? It was outrageous, preposterous. But they answered no to that. The other critical uh, question was one sentence with two conflicting ideas. It asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? The Emperor of Japan? We were Americans. We had no uh, loyalty to the Emperor of Japan. And for the government to presume that we have an inborn, pre-existing racial loyalty to the emperor was insulting. And so if you answered no, meaning I don't have a loyalty to the emperor to forswear, that no applied to the first part of the very same sentence. Will you swear your loyalty to the United States? If you answered yes, meaning I do swear my loyalty to the United States, that yes applied to the second part meant that you were confessing that you had been loyal to the emperor and now were prepared to forswear that and re-pledge your loyalty to the United States. It was confusing. It was very sloppily put together. Mm -hmm. And people didn't know how to answer that, honestly. And my parents took a, a very principled position and said no to that as well. With those two no's, they were categorized as disloyal. And we were transferred from the uh, Arkansas camp, Roar, to what they called a segregation camp in Northern California called Tule Lake, which became the most notorious, most cruel, and most symbolic of the whole irrationality of the internment. People who were outraged and goaded into answering no, and we were transferred there. This camp became the largest of all the internment camps. Most internment camps had from uh, 6,000 to about 10,000 people. Tule Lake was 18,000 people, the biggest of all the camps. It also had two more layers of barbed wire fence, three layers of barbed wire fence, and to really uh, top it off, the outrage of a half a dozen tanks patrolling the perimeter. Tanks that belong on a battlefield, but they wanted to goad and, and, and intimidate the people there by having those tanks rolling around the perimeter. But the amazing thing is thousands of young, young Japanese Americans were so determined to prove their Americanism. I mean, no one has to go out and prove your Americanism. They bit the bullet, swallowed the ugly taste, and answered yes to those two questions, and went from behind those barbed wire fence to fight for the country that was imprisoning their family. They were put into a segregated, all Japanese American unit and sent to the battlefields of Europe. And they were literally used like cannon fodder wave after wave of Japanese Americans. They sustained the highest combat casualty rate uh, proportionally. 
uh, of all the uh, units in the, the, uh, the Second World War. But they fought fiercely with such incredible courage. And they came back as heroes. They were welcomed back. They came back as the most decorated unit of the entire Second World War. And they were welcomed back on the White House lawn by President Harry Truman, who said to them, you fought not only the enemy, but prejudice, and you won. So you have, you know, the, the loyalty questionnaire was a divisive questionnaire. The Japanese American community was divided, not in half, but in thirds, because there was another group of young Japanese Americans who said, I am an American and I will fight for my country, but I will fight as an American. If I can report to my hometown draft board with my family back home, I would be like any American. I will have something to fight for. I will fight as an American, but I will not go as an internee, leaving my family in imprisonment to put on the same uniform as that of the sentries in those towers guarding over my family. I will fight as an American. This was a gutsy stance to take on the full might of the United States government. But it was also a principled stand, and it was an American stand. And for that, they were tried for draft evasion, found guilty, and transferred from an internment camp into Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. That's how irrational this whole sad saga was, was about. People who stood on principle as Americans, heroic Americans, were taken from a barbed wire prison camp and put into Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. So it is a, an outrageous tale when you get down into the weeds of the story. Before we start taking some audience questions, let me ask you one last thing, which is what about your story do you feel is resonating today? What are the similarities and, and how is it different from things you're seeing going on today? What we're going on today is an incredible cataclysm. Three things, a pandemic, a, a uh, racial, uh, racial justice or racial injustice uh, 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 protest going on and Great depression coming. Uh, our our um, 2008 uh, recession is is nothing like what's happening now, and this pandemic. I mean, you know, Pearl Harbor uh, killed a little bit less than a little bit more than 2,000 people. 9/11 uh, killed almost 3,000 people. Today, this pandemic within a nine month period has killed over 200,000 people. I mean, there are echoes from uh, the in, uh, imprisonment of Japanese Americans, but they are tiny echoes compared to what we are going on, uh, what's going on today. For example, uh, the, to imprison us with, uh, with no charges, innocent people, what's happening uh, on, on the, our Southern border uh, people, women mostly, fleeing the chaos and the poverty and the horror of these, what's going on in uh, Central America and uh, Southern Mexico, fleeing for their lives, literally, from the, uh, the, uh, the lowest of the third world country to the richest of countries in the world. And they're here seeking asylum. Asylum is a human right. And what, how we're treating them now, it's tearing children away from them. In our case, we were intact with our uh, parents. In this case, today, they're putting, being put in cages and th these poor children's lives and psyches are damaged for the rest of their lives. This kind of outrage that's happening now, uh, it, the worst is yet to come, I think.
I'm an optimist, but uh, in the near future, it's a very wor worrisome situation. All right, I'm going to go to some questions that we're getting from the audience. So first, um, Kathy D says, were you influenced by the success of John Lewis's March graphic memoir? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, that was a powerful piece. And I said, you know, I, I as a kid, I love comic books. And uh, maybe we can retell the, uh, the story I told in To the Stars, which was uh, essentially um, I was riding on the coattails of Star Trek. Because on the cover, I, there I am in the Starfleet uniform, looking up, and the title is To the Stars. And uh, uh, so I was uh, aiming at the Star, uh, Star Trek uh, fan re uh, readership. But at the same time, this would, would also serve as my, uh, my main goal of raising the awareness of the uh, uh, imp imprisonment of Japanese Americans. And so... Uh, uh, John Lewis, indeed, and you, I've met John Lewis, and uh, he's a very down-to-earth, warm, friendly person. I met him at a conference, and uh, when I saw that book, and how, how uh, it, I said the our artist has to find a different way, more like anime rather than the the raw, dark kind of uh, drawings that uh, he had in the march. And I'm absolutely delighted with how. Uh, uh, Harmony, and I love her name. Harmony interpreted uh, uh, my story uh, as uh, an anime story. And she made me as a five-year-old an irresistibly adorable kid. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so uh, another question, uh, Phoenix Nita Hill says, hello, George, what do you think your experiences can teach us about America's current immigration policy? Well, that's the polar opposite of what's happening now uh, uh, um, with immigration. Uh, of you know, because our nation is a nation of uh, immigrants. All the uh, Amer all the Americans, uh, with the ex exception of uh, uh, Native Americans, are immigrants who came from another part of the United States, and. I, uh, we we have ha attracted people throughout our history because the shining ideals of our American democracy is what's attractive. The opportunity to make something of their lives, to make it better than where they came from. And so I think uh, uh, what's happening today is un-American, the kind of... Uh, policy that we have. After 9-11, there was the same kind of hysteria that swept through the country, uh, essentially saying all Muslims are potential terrorists. And the first thing that Trump did when he got into office on the first day, he attempted an executive order uh, saying uh, all Muslims cannot come into this country. That was a smackdown. He made Two more efforts. The second one was smacked down. And uh, the irony, here again, life is full of ironies. When the Supreme Court at, le at last approved uh, the third attempt at the uh, Muslim travel ban, at that very same uh, session, the Korematsu case, Korema Fred Korematsu was a uh, young Japanese Americans, uh, American who challenged the internment all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and in 1944, uh, he lost. They, they, uh, uh, the Supreme Court justified the internment. But it was clearly and unquestionably an unconstitutional act. No due process, no equal justice un under the law. This was a nation of laws. And it was only uh, in 2017 when uh, the third attempt at uh, the Muslim, Muslim travel ban was sustained that uh, the Korematsu case was uh, uh, eliminated. And we have a question from Kate S. Uh, I would love to know your thoughts on why this isn't frequently taught in schools and how we can change that. 
I can't agree with her more. As a matter of fact, when I became a, a teenager, I became a voracious reader. I read every history book I could get my hands on, couldn't find a thing about the internment. I also read civics books, thinking that uh, there might be something about the internment there. Nothing. But I was exposed to the ideals, the wonderful, powerful, thrilling ideals of American democracy. And I just couldn't reconcile the two. The only place that I could go for information that I trusted was from my father. My father was a block manager in both camps, the uh, uh, Arkansas camp, as well as at Tule Lake. Uh, the block manager was essentially uh, the liaison between uh, each block in the camp with uh, the camp command. And so he had a pretty uh, large, comprehensive uh, knowledge of uh, the workings of, of camp. And, uh, you know, many parents of my parents' generation did not uh, discuss their internment with their children because it was so painful to them and they didn't uh, want to inflict that pain onto their children. So just, they just didn't talk about it. And there are so many uh, younger Japanese Americans that know little if nothing about uh, the internment. But my father talked to me and he shared the details, his anguish, his, his uh, desperation, but at the same time, his faith in, in the uh, uh, the core ideals of our democracy and that he knew that it would be over. He said, ours is a people's democracy and the people have the capacity to do great things. He said, President Roosevelt was a great president in the 30s when the nation was being crushed by this horrible depression. But because he had the power and the problem solving capacity and the managerial or, uh, order, uh, organizing uh, talent and the ability to articulate that to the public, that he was able to create jobs, post offices all over the country. And it's ironic that uh, post office is one of his great uh, achievements because we have uh, that post office problem right now with the uh, uh, election going on. People uh, are already voting, but he built post offices. And not only did he uh, provide construction jobs, but my father said he even found jobs for the the first people that get fired or don't get employment, artists. He hired artists to paint these magnificent uh, uh, murals of American workers on every one of these uh, 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 pre-war uh, post offices. He built bridges. He built roads. He created jobs and pulled the nation up. He was a great president, but he's also a human being. And... When this nation got swept up in war hysteria and that toxic, toxic mix of hysteria and racism, they saw these faces that look exactly like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. And so with no factual basis, purely on the basis of our, our ancestry, and the, uh, the Chinese people who look like us too had to go around wearing uh, signs saying, I am Chinese to say, you know, I'm not one of those people that bombed Pearl Harbor, insinuating that, you know, we were simply because we looked like this and put us in. And he, the president got swept up in that hysteria and signed that executive order. The, he signed it on February 19, 1942. And we in the Japanese American community observe that every year as the day of remembrance. We will not forget that day that innocent people, innocent Americans, were put into prison camps purely on the basis of race. And, and so he said, even a great president is a fallible human being. But our democracy is a participatory democracy, and we have to be actively engaged in the process. And I gave my father a rough time because that was a time of the uh, civil rights movement. And I, I've been 
reading and listening to on the radio to uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's speeches and uh, all the other people talking about. Them. And I said, Daddy, why didn't you resist? Why, you know, look at all the uh, civil rights people <clears throat> uh, 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 marching and, and protesting. Why didn't you do that? And my, uh, he said, yes, uh, people needed to do that. But I had to think about your mother, you, your brother and your sister. They were aiming guns at me. If I did something and something happened to me, what do you think would happen to you guys? And I understood that. But he said, we live in a participatory democracy. You should be active in student government. And I did get active in student government, became student body president. And, but we had these uh, after dinner conversations constantly. And uh, one Sunday afternoon, we were having this discussion. He said, let me show you uh, how uh, a participatory democracy works. And he drove me downtown to uh, the Adlai Stevenson for president campaign headquarters. He was a, uh, he was a, a, a real Adlai Stevenson uh, fan. And, and I heard his speeches on the radio too. And uh, he was eloquent and inspiring. And he put me in that setting with other people who were passionately dedicated to, uh, to getting uh, Adlai Stevenson, the governor of uh, Illinois, elected president of the United States. And I understood what a participatory democracy is. And I became active in other uh, uh, electoral uh, 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 election uh, campaigns uh, for U.S. senator, uh, for uh, congressman, for mayor of Los Angeles. And uh, 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 my father said, you also have to uh, participate more uh, to, be, to be a part of this democracy. Uh, we, we volunteered at the uh, camp, uh, Stevenson campaign, but you got to serve on commissions. If, you, if you're appointed, you have to uh, 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 serve on boards. And if there should be that opportunity, offer yourself for electoral politics. He really believed in American democracy, but also he knew its weakness that and that's our, our, all our human fallibility. But he knew that the, the other side of us can do better things than our fallibility uh, will bring about. Uh, he was, my father is the real hero of, uh, of they called us enemy. He really sounds like an amazing person. Uh, we have a question from Alonzo N. If you were to take on writing another graphic novel or graphic memoir, and he says, we'd love you to do that, uh, what would you do? <laughs> Let me see, another graphic memoir. What will I do it on? <clears throat> uh, I wonder if we can get a publisher for my adventures in space with the crew of the starship enterprise <laughs> what do you think that would be you great think sell? <laughs> we can pitch that <laughs> uh, we have a question from roberto martinez uh mr takei i just want to thank you for telling your story my question is what was the greatest lesson that you were able to take away from your experiences in your life i think it's what we just talked about that we have to be, uh, our democracy is set up where it's dependent on us to participate. And on the minimal level, level, we have to vote. People are voting already now, but you still have the chance to register to vote. That's the bottom line of good citizenship. Vote. Particip and and uh, also, you got to do your homework. You got to be prepared to vote intelligently. Know the issues, know the pros and cons, and vote intelligently. Beyond that, you can volunteer, as my father taught me. Volunteer and support the person that you uh, think is a better candidate running for office. And, you know, we, uh, we still live in an unequal world. I mean, the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 
she was an educated woman, and yet she couldn't find a job after she finished uh, finished college because she was a woman. Mm -hmm. And because she was an outstanding lawyer, she was able to change all that, went to the very top, the Supreme Court, and made changes that made men more equal by making women more equal. You know, widows who are, whose uh, husbands have died got uh, a certain kind of uh, financial support from the government. But widowers, men who lost their wives, didn't get that. That was unjust. He still had to support the, the child and and take care of all the other responsibilities. So a, an amazing woman like that can uh, make our society a better democracy. And we all have the capacity to contribute in whatever way we, we can. And so vote is voting uh, with information is the bottom line. From there, my father used to say the hardest form of government is a democracy because we have to make it work. The, the easiest form of government is a dictatorship. You can just sit back and let the man do it for you. Let him do it. I Very am, easy. I am sad to say we have come to the end of our hour. I would it goes fast, doesn't it? I would love to <laughs> continue this conversation for much longer, and we still have quite a few more questions. But um, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us. And I truly appreciate the graphic memoir you've done, the play Allegiance that you've worked on, uh, everything. And your activism is inspiring to all of us, I think. So um, I just want to thank you and thank everyone who's participated, all of you who've added questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone. Uh, please visit kpbs.org slash one dash books um, to learn more about the 2020 uh, One Book San Diego. So thank you, Mr. Takei. Oh, call me George. All right, George. Well, thank you. I've been calling you Beth. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed our conversation.